Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen to today's live stream. We've actually got a lot of people, a lot more online than normal. So thank you so much for being online. We're going to talk today about, you probably heard over the last couple of days, there's been a huge amount of escalation in the Middle East. This shouldn't come as a surprise to any of my subscribers because I've been saying this for the last six to eight weeks specifically about Iran and Israel and the implications of this on oil prices and the shipping lanes and inflation and supply chain shocks and the, the, the inflation as a result of the energy and things like that. So really, if you've been listening to me for the last six to eight weeks where I've been talking about these things and a lot of people just never thought these things would occur, well, again, <laughs> we're we are here yet again. These things are occurring. So we're going to talk a lot about this today, but not really from the media point of view, because they're really missing the main points as to what's going on here. And as always, just using propaganda to um, emphasize one side of, uh, of the story. And as you know, I try to, and it's very difficult, but I try to be unbiased with, with my reporting. There, there will always be bias, of course, with it doesn't matter who we are, because we are uh, human beings. But I try my best to be completely unbiased with everything. Now, try that today so that regardless of what's going, going on, I'm not trying to take a side here. I just want to give you the facts so that you can see what I'm seeing. And when you see this, you can kind of anticipate what's um, coming up. And if you would be so kind to stick around until the end of the video, I want to just talk about the mini documentary that I released over the weekend. And uh, it was supposed to come out on Saturday. If you read my post, you'll know that it was not permitted to be released on Saturday and it had to be edited. I want to talk about that at the end of the video. So we'll, we'll come on to that. And I'd love to ask you for some feedback on uh, some certain points that I can make a lot more of this content. But we'll come to that later. Let's, let's just get into uh, the research I've done today. And there's a lot of it, but I want to really kind of summarize it all so that we can give you a, a time saver and we're not here on the stream for, for two hours. So what has happened then? We are here today on Tuesday evening, UK, or where I live on the Isle of Man, uh, UK region time. This has really started, the media saying, two days ago. That's not quite correct. We'll get into why that's not correct. Um, the, all the media uh, stations are saying there was an unprecedented and unprovoked attack from Iran sending 300 um, missiles to, to Israel. Uh, and they keep using the word um, unprovoked and, uh, you know, stuff like that, unprecedented. This, this is not correct. We need to go back to the 1st of April to give context. But even then, you can go way, way back, a lot further back than this. And then you can even go further back than that. So we've got to take one starting point. I'm just going to go to the 1st of April to show you mid-range here what's actually taking place. Because like today, I heard two people talking about it and they didn't have a clue what they were talking about. They were saying, oh, did you hear about Iran sending all of these missiles? Just no one... You know, no one even knew it was coming. Well, that's not true either because they announced it um, beforehand, which tells me it was a political move and not a uh, act of war move, as it were. So we've got this and then they're saying it just came out of nowhere. They, you know, we knew they were going to attack us for no reason. It's like, well, you say us, you're not in Israel, you're not an Israeli, you are here. So, uh, you know, us, I don't know why people use that term anyway. Um but the thing is, because the UK was involved, France was involved, the US was involved. And some people might say, well, why, why on earth are all these countries getting involved? Well, drop a comment if you know, and we'll get on to that later. Why countries are getting involved where you might think, well, what's it got to do with, say, the UK? What's it got to do with France? Why is the US getting involved? It's all a, a very large inter connected web. And if you look into it deep enough, you'll see why everything is, is deeply connected. And another thing that CNN said was that um, this was, a, and I think we've got the actual post, I'll bring it up in a moment, and the article, they said that, um, that uh, 
we actually don't know who, who bombed the consulate, the Iranian consulate, which is where this all begins, and uh, killed the diplomatic staff and the senior commanders. We don't know who did it. There's no, you know, no one knows. Well, actually, it, it says six missiles came from F-35 jets. So I think we can narrow it, narrow it down. But anyway, let's get on to, uh, let's get on to, let's start here. Let's start here, actually. So this is, and then we're going to move through this into what is going to happen as a result. I don't want to, I don't want to be focused on the actual military aspect, because to me, this is what the, the media wants you to focus on. It's the fear of, oh my gosh, we're going into a nuclear war. We're going into this big war with the Middle East. That is not really what I think is the biggest concern here. Although you probably think, well, how could that not be the biggest concern, like military conflict and bombs and all everything else. Well, there's something else that could happen. I'm not saying it will, but there's something else that could happen that could actually have a much more devastating impact on the global economy as a result of, of where this could go. And again, it's a small chance, but I think we need to focus on it today so that we can all be aware of it. So let's jump back in for a moment. Now, the, the CNN leads with this, how uh, Israel and allied defenses intercepted more than 300 Iranian missiles and drones. Now, this was quite interesting. I was surprised by this statement here. Let me just pull this forward. Um, right. Uh, last, last night, night the Iranians launched 320 plus uh, cruise and ballistic missiles and drones for defense capabilities. Uh, next, you might go after headquarters of the regular military and the Revolutionary Guards. You could consider going after their oil infrastructure, uh, the oil fields, the distribution pipe. OK, OK, so key things straight away we've got to look at. This is not just him saying this. I've actually seen this as advice to bomb the Iranian oil fields and destroy the pipelines and all this other stuff. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I don't think they're thinking this through. We did a video on this previously where we actually linked all the pipelines, if you recall, and the, the distribution and how this would be such a huge mistake that it puts energy sanctions that we talked about before that would push our energy prices. It, it, it pales in comparison because when you think who buys the Iranian oil, it's, it's China. And if you were to cut off this energy, what do you think is going to happen? China has to then go out to the, the wider market. And it wouldn't just be China. You would see a knock-on effect of other countries. You're going to see oil prices. This is one of the biggest concerns I think everyone's overlooking, is the oil prices. They want to... Um, uh, so I, I'm saying this, was, I think this is a political move by Iran. And what is now being talked about is this massive... And again, I've talk, I talked about this a couple of months ago, and I think this is all deliberate to get us into a war because war is so profitable for these defense contractors and the defense contractors are lobbying. They give huge campaign contributions. They have their, uh, their tentacles into the politicians and everything. So, so really everything we've talked about, and again, I say it's not just me, it's you as my uh, wonderful subscribers. I, I do read your comments and, and I think together we've kind of pieced together how this would play out everything from Russia and Ukraine all the way to where we are now. If you just read the comments a lot of times, it all pieces together and, 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 it, and it clicks. Even for me, I think, OK, thank you to, you know, Mark. Thank you to, to Sarah for putting that comment because I didn't think of that. And I say, OK, that actually connects that dot. And then it, it gives me the bigger picture. So let's jump back in. Let's jump back in. Pipelines, the export port facilities. Uh, and, and most importantly, I think Israel should be looking at this as an opportunity to destroy Iran's nuclear weapons program, which is the ex... <laughs> I mean, OK, bombing the, all the nuclear uh, weapons. I mean, this is, this is madness. I've, I've got to say, this is, this, some of the things he's saying are madness. Uh, it's worrying, actually. Blowing up all the nuclear weapons sites... I is uh, OK. OK. Now, so, so this is what they were talking about then. Almost all the, the missiles were intercepted. Now, what they don't say is that why were the allies there? Because Iran did actually say we're going to send these these rockets. And and the reason I say it's political is because 
when you look at what happened when their consulate was was blown up and all those senior people were killed, we have to look at that and say, if you were the leadership, and again, I, I don't like the leadership of Iran, just like I don't like the, the leadership of the US currently. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that I, I just don't like what's going on in the world of leadership and politics in a lot of countries. But you've got to look at it from their point of view. And again, let's try and be unbiased here. If you are them and someone has just done that and killed your senior people, blown up your, your consulate, which is supposed to be neutral ground, you're not supposed to be able to do things like this. Although this is the second event we've seen. If we remember the commandos the other week going into a, an embassy, uh, I mean, Mex it, was, it, was, it was insane. Now you've got to look at that. Well, what do you have to do? You can't show weakness with your people. So what do you say? We're going to fire 300 or more rockets at um, you know, Israel. But then you have to say uh, to, you have to give the warning, hey, by the way, we are going to send all of these rockets. And that gives time for US and UK and France and everyone to get ready for these rockets to intercept them. Okay, so then we know there's not really an act of war per se. It's more of a political move and uh, that's the way I see it. If you see it differently, please drop it in the comments below. But I think that is what we actually saw there. I don't see it the way the media is portraying it as this act of war and it was unprecedented and unprovoked. I, I don't personally see that. So where, okay, so they intercepted 99%. So it just talks about all the, uh, uh, okay, this was another interesting point as well. But, but once we see what the damage is, uh, I think it's incumbent on Israel and the United States to reestablish deterrence in a major way. Uh, and I think that means, by definition, Israel's response, and there should be a response, should not be proportionate. Uh, it should be far stronger because uh, when deterrence fails to reestablish... Okay, so again, he's recommending a, you know, an even stronger response. And again, this is how we get into to warfare. It's... Uh, yeah. So this is another point then. So Biden had, uh, had a lot to say on it. To support the defense of Israel, the US military moved aircraft and ballistic missile defense destroyers to the region over the course of the past week. So again, we, why would they move all of these destroyers over the past week? It, it, they knew they had the forewarning, but the media is being very manipulative with the information and they're not saying this. And again, it's not to take sides, it's just to give you context. Uh, Britain was also involved. Uh, France was involved as well. Okay, now let's move on then. Iran's now said that it will strike again if Israel or the US retaliate because they're saying, we gave them warning, we had to do it, and you know all, all this sort of stuff. Iranian officials added that regional neighbors had been informed several days before um, they said it was limited and just for self-defense. Um, UK Rishi Sunak confirmed RAF jets were involved in this and had shot down the drones. Now, why, why does he say? He said if the attack had been successful, the fallout for regional stability would be hard to overstate. And I don't often agree with Rishi Sunak, but I do agree with that statement. The fallout would have been uh, quite unbelievable. Can you imagine if these ballistic missiles and everything else actually hit, this would have gone, this would have been full-blown warfare. And we can see actually the destabilization of the region as well, Syria, Iraq, Iran. This is where a lot of the attacks came from. It wasn't just within Iran, it was via proxies and, and Yemen. Um, it's, it's a very, very difficult situation that's going on there now. Through its mission at the UN, Iran said the mass aerial attack, which it called Operation True Promise, again, further facilitates what I think is happening, was a retaliation for the bombing of an Iranian diplomatic building on the 1st of April, and that it now considered the matter closed unless there was further action. Again, this further cements what I think is going on. It was just a political move. It wasn't there to actually create war. Biden said on Sunday he would convene G7 leaders to coordinate a united response to Iran's brazen attack. Uh, there have been nearly two weeks of speculation about when, where and how 
Tehran or its proxy forces would respond to the 1st of April strike, uh, which killed the, their general, actually, Mohammad Reza Zahidi, a senior figure in their Islamic Revolutionary Guard and eight other officers. Um, a direct attack by Iran on Israel, however, was not to be not believed to be on the card. So again, we've seen this change, we've seen this slight movement. And then we've had the IDF chief saying that it will be met with a response. So again, this is not good news. We're going to see further escalation. There's a lot of junk media as well, trying to compare the two militaries and nuclear weapons and all this sort of stuff. This is, this is really just garbage. They are just um, trying to <laughs> create something out of nothing. Because if you think about it, and we can answer this question <clears throat> quite easily, <clears throat> excuse me, quite easily anyway, you can't really compare the military of Israel and Iran because Israel is not alone. <clears throat> it has the US and UK and France and everybody else as, as backers, most powerful militaries here, you know, when they're all, all combined. So it's, it's nonsense, really. Uh, now, this is really, we, we have to come back to the 1st of April. This is what happened. There was a, a they blew up the consulate uh, for whatever reasons. I'm not going to get into it because I don't actually know the full background to this. So I'm not going to comment on it. All I know is that this was blown up by Israeli warplanes. They, they say that this has all been confirmed again. And until I see a statement, I'm not going to comment on that either by F-35 jets. OK, so, so we know this. Now, I want to get into the, the economic side of things on this and the finance aspect and what I see as a result, because we have crude. Crude, actually, if we look over, I've got it on a longer scale because I wanted to show you 2008. Actually, let me let me start here. I'm just going to pull it back to here so we've got greater context. Now, if we look at what happened here and you look at these two charts side by side. So this is your Brent crude price and this is your headline CPI. So if you look at this side by side, what do you notice? They are very carefully correlated. So it tells you what we can expect. So if we look at 2022 here, this was... I, I think it was around March of 2022 when we saw those spikes. And you also look, what did we see? We saw this really heavy CPI. So this is your inflation. Now, if this comes back again, uh, let's pull up 2008, actually. OK, now, you remember 2008? Everyone remembers this because it was the massive recession, what known as the Great Recession. You look where oil prices went to. We got a hundred and what's that? One hundred and forty dollars a barrel. It causes a recession. This is what high oil prices causes. It causes a recession. Now, you think how this effect was was global last time around, and then the energy prices really dropped off a cliff, and then it helped to stabilize, and interest rates were, were lowered, and that helped to stabilize. Uh, we had quantitative easing was increased, that helped to, to stabilize. So it was quite a short-lived recession, even though the ripple effects were fairly global. Now, this is where I think there's a risk that people aren't really talking about, which surprises me. The risk I see is that if this continues, and I want to bring in the, the shipping routes and, and things like that in a moment, and we did see this big conflict, you're not just going to see a $100 barrel of oil, $110. You could see easily what we just saw in 2008 on that chart. You could see $130, $135. You could even see $140 for a barrel of oil. That will, if it was prolonged, that will cause a global recession. And if it continues, that will cause a global depression. That means jobs would just collapse. It means everything would just start to collapse very quickly. You think of those of you waiting for your mortgage rate to come down, for interest rates to come down. Forget it. You wouldn't see the interest rates coming down. This is the other problem. 2008, even though it was a big issue, there was a lot of tools at the disposal to fix it. This time around, those same tools aren't available. And this is what I think is the biggest worry.
um, not the actual military conflict itself, although that is a big worry, of course. I don't want to underplay it, but I think this is the biggest the biggest worry. And you see where we are here, $85. So we go back to the last week. Uh, we're at $85 a barrel here. We go to, to crude, and again, we can see 2008, what happened. We had the, the spike, 140 a barrel. It had to come right down to 45 before we started to see recovery. Um, we look at the last week and we see well, that was the 12th here. We see where all of this is going. We're at $90 a barrel here. We've got to, we've got to monitor this. Um, so yeah, this could threaten to send fuel prices skyward if the conflict escalates and it will disrupt global supplies. Uh, this was CNN uh, suspected Israeli strike. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> suspected. I love the way they use, use words like this. Uh, oil prices spiked Friday to levels not seen since October. Now, I want to talk about the Strait of uh, Hormuz here. This is this is a choke point, and then we'll just we'll look at some of the other choke points. The conflict could disrupt shipping. So this is globally. More than a quarter of global maritime, here it is, oil trade goes through this strait, including crude, petroleum products such as gasoline, and it flows through it every single day. If this gets, um, if this escalates, Iran has the capability to attack oil tankers passing through the strait using drones, missiles, or submarines. This is the key point. They're talking about all this normal conventional military, all oh, the nuclear weapons here, nuclear, well, we've got these jets, we've got those jets. They're completely overlooking the elephant in the room. You think about for those of you who studied military tactics or you've been in the military, what do you always look at? Like, you don't just look at the things they're talking about here, but you look at your supply chains and you look at your food and how you're going to get um, diesel and, and weapons and ammunition up the supply chain to keep, to keep your soldiers and your equipment going. Well, this is where guerrilla warfare comes in. You think of Vietnam and you think of um, Afghanistan, if you've been to those of you in the military, like I've been to Afghanistan, I've been to Iraq, I've been to a lot of places. And you study beforehand, you study what happened with Russia when they were in Afghanistan. Failed. They were there for forever and they just couldn't do it. I mean, when you have these guerrilla warfare tactics, very, very effective and very hard to deal with. And this is why you see this with, with a lot of countries that don't have that same capability, don't have the same weaponry. You see a lot of guerrilla warfare tactics. And this is what I think that is being underlooked because you've got all these straits, you've got Syria and Lebanon and Iraq and um, uh, Iran and all, they don't even need to do a lot of this. They just fund all of these groups and they attack the, 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 the ships, the oil containers, they, they do other things in these straits. It's all you need to do and everything's closed down. But yet, are we really talking about that? No, we're talking about bombs and uh, who's got the most troops. It's, uh, I don't know, maybe I just overthink these things and uh, my brain works differently. A worst case scenario would entail a total blockade of the Strait by Tehran. Um, but they think the, the, out, the, the likelihood of this is low. I don't think it's low at all. I think it's actually medium to high if there's a retaliation. This is the most significant choke point in the global oil market. And it would have an, an, an impact on global oil supplies. This is, uh, yeah, so here's, here's the strait. Here we go. So if we, we, we've got Oman, we've got UAE, Qatar, Pakistan, uh, Iran here. Uh, this is the strait here and his Kuwait, obviously a big oil exporter. And we know all about Suez and everything else. This this could really get this could really get quite severe, and, and I pulled this up as well. This is the choke points that we're seeing at the moment. You see, all of these choke points have already got got risk levels with them. This is where we could see the breakdown of globalization. This person actually analysed it as well. Uh, maritime choke point status: Panama, Amber, Gibraltar, Tick, Cape of Good Hope, Amber. Baltic, Amber, the Turkey Strait, it's like a red siren, that's an alarm bell, the Suez alarm bell, Hormuz alarm bell, Bab el Mandeb alarm bell, um, Malacca, right, you've got all these 
issues right now. So here's your primary and, and secondary as well. All of these things, this is the other one you, uh, near to Djibouti here in, um, we've got Ethiopia, Eritrea, Yemen, um, This, this is all such a big risk. Look at them all. Istanbul. People are massively underestimating all of this. I, I really, I really do think so. <laughs> this video went a lot longer than I expected as well. Uh, but now let me talk about what I said. Right, so the documentary. I, I want to get back to... If you've subscribed to me from any of my previous miniature, I'm going to call them mini docus, documentaries, because that's what they are, and they're hour long. Just that 20 minutes or 18 minutes that you saw, that I can't even tell you how many hours of work. I used to put in anywhere from 100 to 200 hours of work for one video <clears throat> that was that sort of size. So I don't know how many hours I put into that one, but it was uh, it was a lot. And what actually happened was I had it ready to go on Friday and then there were some issues and there's you know YouTube gets involved because I have a channel manager um, because obviously I cover a lot of controversial content and then the Saturday it was all ready to go it was ready to go at 6 p.m. Uh, ready to be released at 6 p.m. and what happens 45 minutes beforehand if you saw my post you need to be on mobile though if you're if you watch on a TV like half of you do uh, you won't maybe see the post but I put out a post which which would have gone to your mobile and that talked about and it showed the image oh sorry this video can't go out it breaches this it breaches that all these sort of all a load of nonsense so you'll notice that video had to be so heavily edited <laughs> the editing on that was crazy i know and it was like zooming in and out and doing it was the only way i could get it to work because otherwise i don't know how i would have edited out all these little things i had to sort out. So I know it's heavily edited and I'd love your feedback on that. I'll, I'll, I'll put out a poll or something again onto mobile. I'd like to know what you what you think of the thought of the video. Uh, I'd love your constructive criticism as well. I mean, great. You thought it was great. You know, feel free to say it, but uh, it won't really do much for my, you know, I'm not, it's not like I need an ego boost or something around seeing those comments. I'm really looking for the const constructive criticism so that I can improve on those documentaries. Maybe you want them longer. Maybe you want them shorter. Maybe the editing was too harsh. Maybe the, the, the you know, you don't like background music. I saw some people said that. Um, some people prefer no background music so they can concentrate. Uh, maybe you liked the, um, all the overlay with the B-roll and where I've got documents and I'm highlighting things. Um, I'd love to know what you like and what you don't like so I can actually improve upon it. But as a result, anyway, I had to edit that very heavily, re-upload it for the next day. And then because I've never posted, I don't think on a Sunday before, because I don't work on a, a Sunday that for me, uh, like many of you is that for me, Sunday is the Sabbath. So I don't work on these days, but then I had to get this video up and it's like this big clash of, I had to get it, get it on there and, and, and take care of it all. It was just an absolute mess for the very first production that I'd done of this kind. I want to do a lot more of these going forward. So I'll probably be doing less live streaming. I would say I'll take out the walk and talk, but I know the resistance is going to be fierce if I remove the weekly walk and talk, which takes up the most time actually. So I will, uh, that's like 10 to 12 hours to make that video. So I'll try and um, keep the weekly walk and talk. So maybe I, I might even go down to three videos a week. Say a stream on a Tuesday, walk and talk on a Thursday, production, you know, miniature production on a, on a Saturday. Because uh, there's no way I'd be able to do videos every day and that production because that, that takes so long. It's just such a, huge, um, such a huge video to make. So that is you up to date on it all, really. I'd love your comments. Um, I will put out a poll. I'd love your feedback on it. And anything else you want to add, please let me know. But thank you so much for, for watching and, and being a subscriber here. I really appreciate you uh, so much. Thank you so much. And if you're in the Patreon, the private community, uh, thank you so much because, well, you know why if you're in the, the community, you're watching all the updates. There's a lot uh, going on personally. So thank you so much for, for everything. And that's it. 
for today. Take care. God bless you. God bless your family and your communities. And I'll see you next time.